Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, hopefully you can hear me at this point in time. Uh, I'm Tom Cam, the Executive Director of Alachua Conservation Trust. I want to welcome you tonight to this virtual plant walk that's going to be led by Susan Marinowski. Uh, Susan's walks are typically done in the spring in some of our most popular events. And uh, unfortunately, due to circumstances, we're not going to do that. But we are trying this new format out. And it was well received last month. So we're trying it again. And uh, Susan was gracious enough to uh, be willing to do this with us tonight. So I, I appreciate that. Um, most of you, I know a lot of the names of, of people attending tonight, know what the work we do as an organization, but I'm just going to go over it briefly because there are some some folks on uh, this evening who are maybe not familiar with the work of Alachua Conservation Trust. So uh, we work primarily in 16 counties across North Central Florida, and we have sort of three main um, objectives as an organization. One is conserving the land and water resources within our region. Um, that's mostly done through land conservation of acquisition or conservation easements for acquiring the development rights on properties. Um, two is doing restoration on properties. Uh, we manage and own um, about 15 nature preserves right now all across North Central Florida. We also work with private landowners to do restoration on their properties and trying to bring them back to what Florida looked like you know, before European settlement. And the third thing, which is sort of the component tonight that we're working on, uh, is environmental education and outdoor recreation. Um, some of that's geared towards K through five, and then some of it's just workshops like these to allow people to learn more about their natural surroundings uh, and some of the things that make our part of the, the country and the world special and unique. Uh, and tonight that's plants. Um, so again, a big, huge thank you to Susan for being willing to do this. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Heather Obar, our outreach coordinator, uh, to do a more formal introduction and talk about the logistics for this evening. So thank you for coming on tonight and uh, looking forward to hearing what uh, Susan has to share with us. All right. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Obera. I'm the community outreach coordinator for ACT. And uh, I part of my job is to help put on events like like the one that we're having tonight. We're really happy that all of you are here with us. And uh, I just wanna go over briefly the format of the program tonight, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have a presentation from Susan in a few minutes, and she's gonna be sharing her screen. She'll have some slides on her screen. So um, if you are tuning in by phone, it's a little bit more difficult um, to view the presentation. Uh, however, we are recording everything, so if you just want to listen to the audio, we will post a recording uh, after after today. Um, also, if somebody couldn't log on tonight or, or wasn't able to make it, uh, there will be a recording posted for them to view later as well. Uh, so Susan's uh, presentation uh, will, will last about 45 minutes, and then once her presentation concludes, we're going to have a question and answer session. And you can submit your questions throughout the presentation. You can do so via the chat option or the Q&A option. Uh, and you can do that uh, anytime. And um, I will try to respond to as many as possible that I've received your, your question and uh, we'll queue it up for hopefully an answer from Susan at the end. We may not get to all of the questions, uh, but Susan's included her contact information at the end of the talk so that if you do have a, a very specific question that you wanna send her way, you can do that afterwards. So we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, and then also, I just wanted to say briefly before I introduce Susan, that um, uh, programs like this are made possible through support from our community, and uh, we're really grateful that you all are here. Um, if you want to support environmental education like this, you can text Florida Wild to the number 44321 and uh, make a donation supporting environmental education that ACT does in the community. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, but first I'd like to give a brief introduction and then we are going to mute our cameras and our mics so that you can enjoy the presentation and then we'll be back afterwards. So our speaker tonight is Susan Marinowski. She grew up in North Florida and holds degrees from UF in fine arts and wildlife ecology with an emphasis in public education. Susan has pursued a passionate interest in native plants and has been a student and practitioner of herbal medicine for over 20 years, having studied with a number of nationally known herbalists. So we're very excited to have Susan with us today. Uh, I wish we could have done this in person out on our preserve. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to. Susan's been so gracious as to do this via Zoom, 
and hopefully it, in the future we'll be able to get out there with her on one of the preserves. Uh, but without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to Susan and we are going to mute our mics and cameras. I hope everyone enjoys the presentation. So yes, thanks to Heather and uh, Tom and Lisa, um, to ACT for all the work they do and for providing this platform for a uh, little virtual plant walk. So hopefully everyone can see the slides here and um, we're going to get right into it which is to say, welcome. Um, and we've really had the introduction here. Um, I, I wanna focus tonight on common edible and medicinal plants. Um, and also with a great focus on plant identification. This is something I run into with, you know, helping new people get introduced to the plants is how, you know, how to identify them. What is this? So I'm gonna give you a lot of hints about that today, tonight. Um, and then I will also be talking about the safe, effective, gentle, nutritional and healing qualities of some of the plants. I'm not gonna be talking about um, any really toxic plants except for one that you're gonna to wanna to watch out for. Um, so uh, I, what I really wanna give you is, you know, the opportunity to go in your backyard 10 minutes before supper and gather some greens, add them to your meal, add that variety to your diet and, uh, um, that that's what I really hope you'll get out of this. Um, I will mention some preparations during the talk, things like teas and tinctures, um, syrups, salves, which are an external um, application. And I can't really go into preparation details in this short amount of time that we have, but um, that remains a subject for you to explore on your own. There are lots of resources out there. Um, of course, um, no talk tonight should be construed as medical advice. Um, talk to your practitioners for that kind of advice. Um, and also I should say that many of the pictures I've used um, tonight are borrowed from the web and many of them from the, UF, um, the USF Atlas of Florida Vascular Plants. I'll give you a link to that site at the end but I appreciate them for being out there and for being a really good taxonomic reference for Florida, um, where I can look up plants. But I should say that uh, any errors in this entire presentation are my own and can't be blamed on them. Um, I should also say that I have never had a botany course. So for all you botanists out there, I apologize. Um, this is gonna be a lot of repetition for you. Um, for anyone who um, has been on my walks before, this will also probably be a bit repetitive. Uh, but hopefully we have some new folks and uh, there will be something useful for you here. So I like to start by talking about the ways of knowing the plants. Um, these, it's been helpful to me to understand that there are these different methods of knowing and to go into each one of these when I discover a new plant for myself. And hopefully this will be something that is helpful to you. So we can know plants through science by naming them, by the taxonomy, um, by their chemical constituents, their pharmacological effects. We can know about their ecology and their natural history through science. Um, more recently, science brings us genetic studies that have been rearranging many of our classifications. And, and so science gives us some really windows into what's going on with the plants and what goes on in our bodies when we ingest the plants. Um, we can also look to tradition. This is something that herbalists do a lot. We look at the history of how a plant was used, the folklore of the plants, information from elders, ethnographic studies or accounts. Um, this is more of a qualitative source of information, um, but very, very rich. Um, plants have been used by humans for thousands of years, many thousands of years. So where it has been written down or transmitted orally, we, we do have information like this. Uh, we can also look to our experience, the experience um, that we get through sensory processing, the taste, the smell, the feel, the visual patterns of the plants. Um, we can also ask other people their experience. So um, for example, herbalists in North America today have a lot of communication through the, uh, the horror of Facebook <laughs> where we share many of our experiences. 
each other. And this has been a very fruitful um, time for herbalists in, in this country and in this time. Um, we can also use intuition. I don't recommend using intuition alone. In fact, I don't recommend using any of these methods alone. Um, but intuition might include feelings, dreams, some kind of divination. Uh, the old doctrine of signatures, which said that plants looked like something that they were supposed to heal. Um, but my, my world is strongly informed by these first three ways of knowing um, at first, and then my intuition is able to feed off of these other, um, these other ways of knowing and, and give me insight. And, and the way that that happens is that I might be uh, seeing a new plant and my intuition need me to know which, um, you know, which family I need to look in to identify that plant. Or I might be sitting with a person and they have a certain problem and my intuition will suddenly click on a plant that I think might be very useful for them. But of course, that's based in many years of, you know, messing around with these plants. So, uh, so these are the ways some of the ways of knowing plants. I imagine there are other ways too. <laughs> I also wanted to give you this um, little diagram just very briefly here so that you have the notion in your head that there are these energies that exist in plants and in people. These are very real down to earth things. I'm not talking about, you know, even, uh, anything uh, etheric or spiritual. I'm talking about, you know, really down to earth. Um, you, you might hear me mention terms like cooling or warming or drying or moistening for a plant. And that means that it's going to, you know, have the chemistry that actually pushes the energy in that direction. So this also might give you the idea that if someone is cold or feeling cold, you might give them something warm. If someone has a lot of wet, drippy snot coming out of their nose, you might consider using something to help dry them up. So this is just common sense, but these are the basic energetics that Western herbalists use right now in this country. I'll also be using a couple little symbols tonight. These are easy. <laughs> the fork and the spoon mean it's edible. The little green leaves mean it's medicinal. And then this little exclamation point um, says, uh-oh, you know, look out, uh, potential hazard. They're going to show up over here. I think you might be able to see my mouse over here in the left side in that little green bar. So you can watch for these as we talk about the plants. So let's dive in with a plant right away. Um, elder, this is the great elder mother. She is the queen of medicinal herbs. I call her she because every traditional culture that's used this plant refers to her as a female, um, the mother of the queen, revered throughout the Northern hemisphere for her edible and medicinal qualities. Um, it is perhaps uh, one of the most important native medicinal plants that we have. Uh, we use both the flowers and the berries as both food and medicine, and uh, they are delicious. Uh, lucky for us. Uh, I will talk about all of those applications in just a minute, but first I want to start with um, the biggest caution that I will give you tonight. So let's say you're a beginner and you want to collect some elder flower and you encounter these two plants out in the wild. Uh, because the flowers are an important medicinal part of elder, everyone wants to be collecting them. They're in bloom right now, by the way. They're very beautiful. Um, and so this is the stage where elder on the left looks an awful lot like water hemlock on the right. Water hemlock, Cicuta maculata, is the one plant in Florida that will kill you. <laughs> so we might as well get it out of, out of the way first here. Um, so, uh, so I, I want to compare these two flowers. And if you squint just a little bit at your screen, you might notice that the elder inflorescence on the left has a somewhat chaotic form to it. And the hemlock inflorescence on the right has a very regular form, almost fractal, you might say. In fact, it is very fractal. I'll show you a close up in just a minute. Um, 
and I used the word inflorescence, and I just want you to know that a group of flowers that are hanging out together like this on, uh, on a flower head are called an inflorescence. So there's a little vocabulary. Let's look at the elder close up. This inflorescence is somewhat flattened um, and it has a chaotic form, as I said. Note down at the bottom where I've circled it that the, uh, the stem splits into five parts. And then as it goes up, it, the flower stem keeps splitting, but it, it splits at different intervals. They're all different lengths. They're going all different directions. So um, each time five small stems split off, but um, they are not in any kind of regular form. So this is what I mean by a chaotic form. I may even be using that word chaos incorrectly. I'm sure someone will correct me later, <laughs> but um, let's say it's not regular, it's irregular. Um, uh, by comparison, the hemlock inflorescence takes the form of what we call an umbel, U-M-B-E-L, and you can use the word umbrella to remember that if you like. They sometimes are flat, but they're usually kind of curved like an umbrella. The flower, this is a flower cluster in which the stalks are nearly equal length, each stalk, and they all come from a central point on the stem. You can see I've circled that part of it. You could say um, that this is an umbrella shaped umbel, if that, you know, if that's helpful to remember it. So looking at them in comparison, you can see on the left, the elder flowers in their flat, irregular clusters, and the hemlock flowers on the right in their rounded umbels. Also, you might notice that the elder plant is a very full sort of shrub, while the hemlock plant is somewhat airy and open. So let's look a little further. Let's look at the leaves. First of all, I want you to know that each one of these is an entire leaf of each species. Um, how do I know that these are entire leaves? Because in plants where the leaves attach to a stem, there's a node, a, a thickening. And you can see the thickening. Let me get my mouse here again. Hopefully you can see that thickening at the base of each one of these leaves where they attached to the stem. But there is no thickening where the little leaflets come off of the leaf stem. So the leaf of elder on the left is pinnate, which means it's divided into an odd number of leaflets. So it's always gonna be seven or nine leaflets. It's always gonna have one leaflet in the middle at the end because it's odd, an odd number. Um, and so this is just an, you know, an oddly pinnate leaf is what we would call it. The leaf of hemlock on the right, on the other hand, is doubly or triply pinnate. So it divides and then it divides again into even smaller leaflets. I think I counted about 48 little leaflets here uh, a while back, um, but this is still a single leaf. So this is you know, a pretty good comparison of the leaves of elder and water hemlock. Um, be aware though that these can vary. So we, you know, we want to look at several different characteristics to identify a plant. So, um, for example, before they start splitting into all those tiny leaflets, the water hemlock leaves can kind of look like an elder leaf. So you wouldn't want to look at the leaves alone. But how about we look at how the leaves are arranged on the plant. So leaf arrangement adds another level um, to our comparison. And this begins to get really easy when we see you know, we see the flowers, we see the leaves, and now we see this arrangement where elder on the left has opposite leaves, and I've circled the place where those two leaves are directly opposite each other on the stem. And hemlock on the right has alternate leaves, which means one leaf comes off on one side, this, this case to the left, and then above it, another leaf comes off to the right, and um, so they're going to alternate from one side to the other. Uh, oh yeah, and here's a little diagram floating in of opposite and alternate leaf arrangement. And this is an important, you know, little facet in identifying plants that we've just applied here to elder and hemlock. 
Also on hemlock, you might notice the purple coloration of the stem, but we can't always count on that. And a lot of times, elder also has reddish or purplish stems, so we don't want to make that our only, the only thing we look for. Um, fortunately for us, though, later on, when they make their fruits to distribute their seeds, um, it's easy to tell them apart because elder makes these beautiful dark purple berries. They start out green and then they turn purple when they're ripe. And hemlock on the right makes seeds. And these seeds are very much like dill seeds or carrot seeds because it's in the same family with those other plants. So um, just to answer one question that I often get on plant walks, if you harvest all of the elder flowers on your bush, you will never get any berries. So yes, it does move in the plant world, uh, in flowering plants, it moves from a flower to the berry or the seed, the, whichever um, way the plant is going to distribute its seed for reproduction. So if you harvest all the flowers, you don't get any berries. So you might want to plant ahead <laughs> if you want some of both, or you might just really like elderflower and harvest all those and forget about the berries. But um, on the other hand, you might really like the berries and skip the flower harvest and just go to the berries later on. So just a real quick summary again, elder on the left, the full bush with these somewhat flat inflorescences that are very irregular the opposite leaves that are oddly pinnate and producing berries in the end. On the right, hemlock with the very regular umbels, a rather open airy plant, and it has alternate leaves, one on one side, one on the other, often doubly pinnate and producing seeds in the end. So we've looked at um, a bunch of different things that you can look at in plants to help you identify them. And we've learned a little bit vocabulary and you've also learned about the one plant that could kill you flora. So it's pretty much all gravy from now on. So let's look at what we can do with elder. There is so much. Um, the flowers and the fruits are the parts, whoops, I'm sorry, that are used internally. Um, edible uses of elder flower include elder wine, you can make elderflower mead, you can make a lacto-fermented soda or a fizz or a champagne, they make a fantastic champagne. Um, you can cook them up as fritters. So many, many el edible uses of elderflower. Edible uses of elderberry include wine, pie, jam, and you know anything else that you can do with a berry, you can do with elderberry. The berries are tasty and they're fairly prolific, but you will have to watch and get there before the wildlife gets them. And this is a problem in Florida. It's kind of hard to uh, catch the berries <laughs> at the right moment. Um, I do suggest you plant one of these in your yard, by the way. Uh, that's the best way to have some uh, control over who gets the berries. The only caution with the berries is that some people do react with gut um, upset or diarrhea if they eat too many raw berries. So cooked products are better here um, in the elder world. So let's talk about the medicinal qualities just a little bit. Um, elder really excels as a medicinal plant. It was widely used by Native Americans and Europeans. It occurs um, all the way around the world in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the, uh, the American species, by the way, which is often called Sambucus canadensis, is now considered to be a subspecies of Sambucus nigra, which is the European species. So they're all related and they have uh, the same uses. Elderflower is highly valued for its diaphoretic um, properties. Diaphoretic means that it helps to take the circulation to the exterior of the body, helps you sweat a little bit, and is a very useful property of plants for fever. This is not uh, a quality that's going to suppress the fever. It's going to help your body um, have the most natural fever resolution possible. Um, as 
we probably all know, or we should know, fever is our friend because uh, when your temperature gets up to 101, that pretty much zaps um, most viruses. Um, of course, nothing I say tonight can be applied to COVID because uh, COVID-19 is a very different um, infection than we've seen in the past. But most of our common viruses, colds and the flu, get zapped when you have a fever. And you want that. The fever also cranks up your internal immune response. So we don't want to suppress it. But we do want some help with it. An elder will help. Um, it is also diuretic, will help you pee a little bit. Um, so it's, you know, immune stimulating and anti-inflammatory. It has these wonderful properties that help when we are feeling at our worst. <laughs> Elderflower is specific for influenza and the fevers that come with it. Um, it also helps with expectoration of mucus in colds or asthma. And it was probably the part used the most in traditional medicine systems. Elderflower tea has been used for centuries by women as a softening, healing, and beautifying wash or lotion um, by men too. <laughs> to be a gender specific thing. Elderberries as some medicine um, are a bit more of a recent thing. Um, they were mostly traditionally used as a seasonal food. So they would be eaten, you know, in the fall when they were ripe, and this is being in the further north part of the northern hemisphere, and would give a little bit of an immune boost going into the winter season. Um, but uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, they were studied very extensively, uh, mostly in Israel, where the results of, of several human trials have showed their protective qualities against viral bugs. Um, they um, can actually prevent people from being infected by a virus, and they can reduce the number of sick days once someone gets sick if they're used as a treatment. So this is very well confirmed now by human research. Um, this syrup product, Sambucol, is the product that came out of that research in Israel. And of course, now every single company in the world makes elderberry syrup, and you can make it at home very easily. Uh, there's all kinds of recipes on the web. Elderberries work by putting our immune system into a higher state of preparedness to fight uh, off a virus. Um, and it also actively blocks the binding of the flu virus to the cells. So it inhibits the flu virus from replicating. Um, as we all know now that we've heard so much about viruses, they aren't really alive themselves, but once they get into your cell, that's where they replicate. And so um, elderberry has a very useful function there in preventing that replication. Um, it can be taken as a tea or a tincture or a syrup. Um, or something um, that would be like a combination of a tincture and a syrup that I would call an elixir. That would be a wonderful way to take it. Um, whether it, uh, it works for COVID-19, we can't say. Um, but there are a lot of herbalists working with COVID clients right now. And um, we're, you know, we're learning more and more about uh, how that virus works. Um, so, in summary, both flowers and fruits can be used for their diaphoretic, antiviral, and expectorant properties. The flowers being a bit more um, diaphoretic, a bit more useful with a fever. The berries being a bit more in the antiviral end of the spectrum. For example, you might want to take them if you think you've been exposed or if you uh, are just feeling a little run down. <clears throat> the only caution with the berries is that they they are an immune stimulant. They are st stimulating the immune system. So they might not be appropriate for folks with autoimmune conditions. And they might not be appropriate if the body is already cranked up for battle. Um, there, there has been uh, a bit of discussion about elderberry potentially causing cytokine storm, which is something we are all learning about with this uh, COVID infection. But this is, um, this is a far out speculation, if you ask me. First of all, when someone's having cytokine storm, they're in the ICU and they're on their deathbed and they're not taking elderberry. Um, so uh, 
that's just for starters. And the other thing is that elderberry contains many, many flavonoids and phytochemicals that are very balancing to the body. So it is a very unlikely thing that it would cause something like that to happen. Um, in fact, we don't know of anything that causes that to happen, except that a person is about to die and the body is making a last ditch effort uh, to save. So, um, so that sums up um, elderberries, elderflowers. They are safe for children. Um, they are safe in pregnancy. Um, the other parts of the elder shrub tend to be a bit more on the toxic end of the spectrum. Um, so they can be used externally. The bark and leaves are wonderful as an antiseptic wash or as a pain reducing salve. So, so the only caution, the real caution is don't confuse it with hemlock. <laughs> um, cook the berries and enjoy. So you've seen me use this term Sambucus nigra for the elder. And this brings up the whole way that we name plants. And again, apologies to the botanists. I know you guys are <laughs> bored by this business, um, but here we go. Genus and species are the ways that we name all of the biological organisms on the planet. Um, we also have common names for a lot of things, but there could be a problem with common names because if you sent me out to get snake root, for example, depending on what part of the country we're in. There, I think there's about 10 different kinds of plants that are called snake root, um, including echinacea, black cohosh, and a number of other plants. So, um, you know, so what do you mean? You got to tell me the genus and species. This is botanical Latin. Latin is a dead language, but it's kept alive by uh, us using it for naming the living things on earth. Um, this language is maintained by international agreement. Everyone understands it. So you can go to any country and ask for Sambucus nigra syrup, uh, and they'll know what you mean. They, they might not know the word elder. So every organism, whoops, I'm sorry, is assigned a genus and species according to their place in the classification of life. So the genus is a general term and the species is specific. There are about 15,000 genera in the plant kingdom and about 300,000 species in the plant kingdom. So, um, so it helps if you're planting a landscape or ordering medicine to know, you know what the genus and species are. For example, if we want black cherry, the second plant on the list here, prunus serotina, wild cherry or black cherry, we need to ask for prunus serotina or else the nursery might send us a plum, a peach or an apricot or even an almond. They're all in the prunus genus. So the big question is how can you remember those 300,000 plant species in the world? <laughs> okay, well, let's narrow it down to North Florida where we have 3,000 species of plants, give or take a few. Um, so genus and species, sometimes hard to remember, and uh, there are a lot of plants. So I have found it really, really helpful to take a bigger picture view and learn my plant families. And so now we get to the taxonomy of all living things, including humans, <laughs> but plants are what we're talking about tonight. So we take a step back, a step up, and we go to family, which is a, a, an umbrella grouping over genus and species. So each family includes one or more genera and one or more species. There may be many, many species. And here are a few examples. The ginkgo family, it's a very ancient family. It has only one species remaining in it, and that is ginkgo biloba, the ginkgo tree. On the other end of the spectrum, the more recently evolved sunflower family includes over 30,000 species. But it does help to know which family you're in. And so if you meet a plant and you can place it into a family, you'll, you'll have a really great um, leg up on getting into your field guides and figuring out what it is. Um, 
And so around here uh, in North Florida, if you learn about 30 plant families, you'll have a framework for pretty much most of the things that we see. And in fact, most of the really common plants are in about 10 families. So, um, so it's not that big a hurdle to get the families. So I, I think that's all I want to say about the families, except that um, all of the plant family names end in the letters A-C-E-A-E, -E, which I pronounce A-C-A. -A. Some people pronounce it A-C-E, um, A-C-A or A-C-E. Whenever you see that ending, that is a plant family name. Okay, let's look at a plant. <laughs> so here's that wild or black cherry, Prunus serotina. Um, another thing about the plant names in Latin is that you can look up what they mean, and sometimes that helps you remember them. So Prunus means plum, and serotina means late ripening, which I'm not sure about with this plant because it actually blooms pretty early in the spring here. Um, so beautiful, beautiful flowers here. And note that these are a whole group of flowers and, and inflorescence. And actually these are arranged on a structure called a raceme, which is kind of a long racy bunch of flowers. Many people know this tree in Florida as being toxic to livestock. It's true that the wilted leaves contain high quantities of cyanide or cyanogenic compounds. And uh, this is in the wilted leaves though. So it's uh, not a good tree to have over your horse pasture, but it's a wonderful medicine tree. <coughs> The fruits of black cherry are entirely edible and delicious, and they have a large pit um, compared to the size of the fruit. So there's not a lot of meat on them, but if you can gather a good quantity of them, you can make a pie or jam um, or a wild cherry liqueur, which is very good. I can recommend it. <laughs> or include them as a flavoring in a cough syrup, for example. <clears throat> um, the only caution with wild cherry is to not confuse it with Carolina laurel cherry, which is a related tree that has a bit more of the cyanogenic compounds in it. Not, not enough to kill someone, but it could make you sick. So um, these are two trees that you'll show you in the wild. It's a little bit hard for me to show you the difference, but one of the big differences is that wild cherry is deciduous. So it loses its leaves in the winter. They turn a beautiful sort of yellow orange color before they fall. And the Carolina laurel cherry is an evergreen. So that's a big difference. And you can go out and look at these and learn more about them. But speaking of the cough syrup, I want to talk about the bark because that is the true wonderful medicine of black cherry. Wild black cherry has a very characteristic bark pattern, kind of like a checkerboard texture. You can see on the mature tree on the left here. When it's harvested and dried, it makes a wonderful, wonderful syrup. This was perhaps the most important medicine tree to Native Americans in the U.S. I use barbs from smaller trees or pruned branches, like the, the one you see on the right, um, because they're easier to peel. Um, I harvest them in uh, the winter in Florida, whatever is left of winter. <laughs> um, mainly you want to harvest it when the, when the tree is uh, dormant, or you can harvest it in the spring as the sap starts to come up. But once the tree leaves out, it's a little bit late to get the bark. Although you can get it anytime you want, really, but, you know, we're looking for optimal, optimal medicine here. <laughs> So I either tincture the bark fresh or I dry it. You can see some dry bark in the middle here. It dries to a very pretty sort of uh, rusty color. And then I make a syrup with it. Uh, and the syrup or tincture are calming to a hectic cough. Now this is the kind of cough that someone has that's keeping them up all night. Um, they help to actually dry out mucus a little bit, but they also help the body to effectively expel the mucus from the lungs. So it's, it, you know, it's working on multiple fronts here to help us with 
you know, some congestion or bronchitis or, you know, lung issues. Um, so very, very nice native medicine. And, and so here you have met your first plant family that I'm going to talk about tonight, which is the Rosaceae. And as you can guess, roses are in this, in this family. And so what I've done here is put together a little, um, guide to you know each family a few things you can look for um, so rose family members have sepals of five and i've circled the sepals over here in the yellow circle those are the green things on the back of the flower together they are called the calyx but individually they're called sepals it also has petals of five which you can see on the front of the flower and all those double and triple roses, they still have five petals or a multiple of five. So it, uh, they adhere to the rule. They have numerous stamens, so many stamens we can't count them. The stamens are the yellow um, pollen bearing bodies in the middle of the flower. These are the male parts of the flower. And then the female part of the flower is right in the middle. It gets pollinated and it forms a fruit like the rose hips on the right. And often in this family, the fruits <clears throat> will retain the sepals. So you can see these rose hips each have five sepals, like a crown on the top of them. I say often, some of the fruits retain the sepals, some do not. Um, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. So, um, the retention of the sepals is true of some other families as well. For example, the blueberry family, you might have noticed they the berries have a little crown, a five-pointed crown on the end of them. Those are the sepals left over from the flower. But my point is that uh, that's a different family. And so many of these characteristics of plant families will apply to a lot of different plant families. But it's the combination of characteristics that make a pattern that applies to one family. And so when we combine these sepals and petals of five numerous stamens, we get the rose family. Um, and uh, just to back up real quick here to the wild black cherry flowers, if we could look at one of these flowers alone, we would see that it has five sepals, five petals, numerous stamens, and um, that it would, you know, fit that pattern of the rose family. Here's another member of the rose family with some sepals remaining. And if you guess, this is a wild crab apple. Um, those apples from the grocery store also retain their sepals. They get a little smaller on the domestic fruits. But um, yeah, you can see these on pears as well. And yes, those are all members of the rosaceae family. Here's another member of the family that doesn't retain the sepal in quite the same way. The sepal is kind of at the bottom, uh, at the back of the fruit instead of at the front of the fruit. Uh, blackberries. So our native blackberries or, or dewberries. And if you look at this flower, you'll see the five petals, the numerous stamens. It has five sepals in the back. I can tell you that already. <laughs> so you may have noticed from the blackberries around here that they're kind of dry. The, the leaves are dry. They have thorns, of course. Some members of this family have thorns. Um, and this gives us a hint to what blackberry can do for us. And that is that it is a drying and astringent plant. Um, when I say drying, what I mean is that it dries the surface. If you've ever taken a bite of a unripe persimmon, you know what I'm talking about, that dry mouth feeling. But also what astringent plants and the astringent flavor does is it, it, it um, preserves the moisture inside the tissues. So it's having a dual action. It's a drying the surface, but, but preserving moisture in the tissues, which is a really, really great action. So a tea made of blackberry leaves can be used uh, very much the same as you would use the more well-known red raspberry leaves that are in commerce um, in the treatment of wet conditions, such as a runny nose or diarrhea or um, leucorrhea, vaginal drippiness. Um, 
a tea or tincture of the roots is especially useful in the treatment of diarrhea. This is maybe our best diarrhea treatment, the roots of blackberry. Um, so uh, that sort of sums up blackberry. Also, it could be used externally as a wash for things like hemorrhoids or anything that oozing or weep. Like if you had um, road rash down your arm and it was just really oozing, you could use a blackberry tea, blackberry leaf tea on that to dry it up. It, it has a lot of tannins in it, so it's going to make the proteins in the skin tighten up. Um, also really useful for uh, poison ivy or poison oak where it's oozing and weeping. So this is uh, another way that knowing plant families can help us because all of the members of the Rosaceae family, they're all mild astringents of one kind or another. They also have a lot of wonderful fruits that contain all these really healthy flavonoids that are good for our blood vessels and our skin and you know all of our internal organs. They also tend to be cooling and calming. So nothing as wonderful as some blackberry juice on a hot day or some juice from any of the other Rosaceae family members. Um, so we have um, apples, which are malus species, M-A-L-U-S. We have the prunus species. That includes the plums, the peaches, the cherries, the apricots, the almonds. We have the pyrus species. Those are the pears. We have the Fragaria species, the strawberries, and we have all of the Rubus species, the blackberries, the raspberries, the dewberries. Of course, we also have Rosa species, which are roses, which are medicinal in their own right. <coughs> and we have uh, Crotagus species, Hawthorn, which is um, the wonderful herb that's known to be a heart tonic with all those flavonoids. So um, just a quick recap, remember this family, all the flowers, they have those five petals, they have the numerous stamens, they often bloom early in the spring. Uh, some of the, the uh, blackberries are still blooming right now, but our, uh, our wild plums and peaches and things here have all bloomed much earlier in the year. So now let's look at a different family. This is another native. Monarda punctata, horse mint or dotted horse mint, or bee balm is another general name for it. It is related to all the other bee balms that are um, in cultivation and the wild ones that grow in other parts of the country. This is an aromatic and strong flavored member of the mint family. Um, so it is antimicrobial, and by that I mean it helps to balance the microbes in the body. Um, it, herbs are not antibiotics. I never want to use that word applied to an herb because herbs tend to have much more generalized action. So uh, I would like to say it helps balance the microbes in the body. It's also diaphoretic. We talked about that. Uh, drives the circulation outward, maybe causes you to sweat. And it's carminative, so it warms the digestion. Uh, a lot of us need help warming the digestion when we feel indigestion or gas or sluggishness. So this would be taken as a tea or a tincture. It's also antiseptic when used as an external wash on wounds. And it's also a great food. You can add this to a spice blend on your table, um, dry it, um, you know, and have it uh, in a shaker. You can add it to your marinara sauce. It's actually really exquisite in marinara sauce. The old timers around here used to call it rignum. That's apostrophe R-I-G-N-U-M, rignum, um, and by which they meant oregano. It's basically an oregano. Anything that you can do with oregano, you can do better with our native horse mint, I will submit to you. <laughs> So I just want to point out the structures on this plant really briefly. Um, in the picture on the left, they're labeled. We have green or green and white leaves. And then we have sort of pink bracts. 
And then inside there, we have the flowers. Let's look a little more closely at those flowers. If you get really up close, this is what you would see. You can see they're arranged in a circle around, around this uh, stem. And the, remember, the pink things are bracts. And so what we're looking at are the white flowers with the little dots all over them. That one in front kind of looks like a monkey face. <laughs> so this is a little tubular flower. And it has, uh, it's hard to see here, but it has two petals arching up over the top. They might even be fused together. It has a couple of petals on the sides, and then it has one wide petal at the bottom with a little face on it. <laughs> um, and this lower petal is sometimes called a lip. And it is characteristic of this family, the Lamiaceae, the mint family, which used to be called the Labiatae. Labia means lips in Latin. And so um, a while back, they updated all the family names to have this ACA name uh, ending. But uh, we can still look at these old family names and see something interesting here. So this is the lip family, or the, the family with the lipped flowers. So here are some general rules for this family. These um, plants in this family, for the most part, there are always some exceptions, right? But um, this is, uh, for the most part, they have square stems. And you can see in the picture on the left, the angular stem. They have opposite leaves, leaves right across from each other. You can see in the second picture. And these flowers with the lips. And in the third picture, we have the flowers of rosemary. And you can clearly see two petals at the top, two on the sides, and the one big lip at the bottom. This is a five-petaled flower. I should should also say that, but the lip is the really notable feature here. So um, you you might be wondering why we keep looking at flowers, and this is because plants are classified by their reproductive structures, which are flowers. Um, flowering plants need to attract pollinators to help them reproduce. The pollen has to get from the stamens, the male pollen-bearing parts, to the end of the pistil, the female part, in order for the, the pollen to go down the tube of the pistil and get down to uh, fertilize and make seeds. So, uh, so yes, this is true. Plants put their reproductive structures right out for all the world to see. And humans say, oh, how beautiful. We stick our nose right in there. <clears throat> junk and say, oh, what a lovely smell. So <laughs> funny thing that we do, we humans, let's look at another common member of the Lamiaceae family that you have in your backyard. I know you're trying to get rid of this plant, but I'm going to make you want to keep it. <laughs> so here we can see the square stems, the opposite leaves, and the lipped flowers. And in this family, the flowers often arrange themselves in a circle around the stem like this at, you know, at each node. So you can see that they're coming out right above the leaves. Often, not always, but that's one little thing you can look for. So you've probably seen the bright white rootlets that lead to these um, irritating tubers in the ground. Um, this lends uh, the plant its other common name, which is rattlesnake root. You can see where that comes from. But you should also know that this entire plant can be considered edible and medicinal. The leaves and flowers are fine to use in salads or cooked up in stew or stir fry. The root, though, is the really wonderful edible part of this plant. These tubers are sweet. They're like little crunchy radishes. They are uh, really excellent, raw and straight out of the ground, or in salads, or pickled, or cooked. In France, the tubers are known as crossnays, and they sell for about $5 a pound. Um, so that makes you appreciate this plant a little bit more. It's also a mild medicinal plant, and closely related to the plant we call wood betony, which is the official um, medicine betony plant. And Florida betony has similar characteristics. So it has potential application for headaches, for uh, relaxing the nerves, for, and for other um, sort of head maladies. 
Um, an interesting thing about Florida Betony is that it does not have a strong aroma like many other members of this family. But you'll notice I didn't say that aroma was one of the big characteristics. But here are some other members of the Lamiaceae. We have uh, rosemary on the left, we have sage. On the right, we have salvia lyrata. This is a lyre-leafed sage that's common here locally. It's another non-aromatic member of the mint family. We have thyme, and we also have beautyberry, American beautyberry, um, bug repellent leaves, edible berries that are really great when you cook them into a jam or a jelly. So thus the wonderful mint family. Um, what are those three characteristics again? Square stems, opposite leaves, and the lipped flower. Okay. I actually had a lot more slides, <laughs> but that just um, shows you that I cannot be contained. Uh, so I'm going to go through just a couple more plants here really quick, and uh, it will be over. So. Um, Sounds great. Yeah, good. Um, and, and, here's. And Oh, Sorry, just to, if, if anybody does have to jump off because they've got to be some do, do something else, um, then we are recording this. So and we can actually, if Susan's okay with it, provide her full slides um, on our website as well. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Awesome. So here's pepperweed. Um, you've all seen this one in your backyard. It's a member of the mustard family, um, which has almost universal um, edibility in that family. Um, you can eat these little leaves as greens if you learn to recognize them when they come up. Um, once the flower stalk comes up, the leaves aren't so great anymore. But these little seed things that are on the flower stalk, they're called saliques, are wonderful. They're like a little wasabi in your mouth. And you can just eat them right off the plant or you could dry them and grind them up and include them in your spice blend on the table. Mullen. Um, here are two different species of mullen grows around Florida. This is a European or Eurasian weed, but um, is, is prolific here on the roadsides, and you can also bring it into your garden. Um, this is a really important medicinal plant right now. Um, it is really great for lung ailments. It has the magical plant quality of both moistening and helping to dry things that are too moist. And so um, it, it reduces the formation of mucus, but it also stimulates the, the mucus to get thin so you can cough it up. Um, this is an important plant right now that, that we herbalists are using in treatment of COVID. Um, it would be used mostly as a tea or it could include in a syrup. But with this plant, the, the only caution is you have to strain it really carefully because it has fuzzy little hairs all over it and you don't want them going into your uh, into your tea or irritating you. <laughs> Violet is another really softening moistening plant. Just delicious as a food. This is all edible. All the leaves and flowers can also be dried and used as a tea. Um, Violet is famous for softening hard things and was used traditionally in breast cancer and in respiratory ailments with congestion, coughing, or a sore throat. So uh, mildly calming and cooling and moistening. Um, this is another plant that is being used quite a bit in treating COVID because some people are getting, uh, you know, a very hot, irritated condition and violet is very helpful. And passion flower, all of you have seen this one. Um, this is uh, known, you know, for its maypops, its edible fruits, which I think are kind of underwhelming, but it is perhaps better known as a medicinal plant. Uh, it is a relaxing nervine, that means, you know, relaxing to the nerves. It's a mild sedative. It's really great for insomnia, for nervous tension, irritability. Uh, premenstrual tension, perimenopausal tension, any kind of tension, um, especially for people who have trouble falling asleep because their minds are running in circles. That's all of us, right? Um, it also has cardiovascular benefits, not recommended for use during pregnancy, um, 
And when you use this plant, I want you to get the Passiflora incarnata, the native one, because there are a number of species that um, are uh, not known necessarily about their medicinal qualities. And there are some species, notably the red flowered ones, that are somewhat toxic. So I want you to have the, you know, the native species. Um, and this is the last plant, Portulaca purslane, which is a premier edible plant. Um, I don't think of this as medicine, except that I think of all food as medicine. And so this one, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds can be eaten, and it is the highest plant source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, this is the ALA um, form of fatty acids for you fatty acid fanatics. Um, so it's not EPA, DHA, which only occur in animal foods, but um, this one can be converted somewhat in the body to the active forms, and it's just really, this plant makes a fantastic summer salad with uh, chopped uh, up uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, other vegetables, uh, vinaigrette. This is a weed that, you know, you definitely should just let it grow in your yard. So this slide, um, you'll be able to come back and refer to this, but I'm just mentioning a few resources here. The first two are some botany learning resources. Um, botany in a Day is a book, and Botany Every Day is a Facebook group. Um, these two will help you get into that family groove that I'm recommending you get into. Um, then a couple of other sources, Weeds of Southern Turp, Turf grasses will help you to identify all the tiny little weeds that grow around you. It does not have any information about edibility or medicinal qualities, but um, good for identification. And then the Guide to the Vascular Plants of Florida is our Florida Plant Key. Um, that's a book, but there's also the Atlas of Florida Vascular Plants online. If you kind of know what you're looking for, you can find it online. They have a search feature. And then, I'm sorry, these last um, ones are about edible plants. I highly recommend following Green Dean at eattheweeds.com. And also, he has a huge YouTube channel with hundreds of videos about edible plants. Um, and then a few other books here about Florida's wild edibles. And I will close it there. The time has flown by. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's see. Thank okay. you, Susan. We're going to bring everybody's videos back. And right. we've got a couple of really great questions that came in. And uh, if anybody has additional questions, they can also uh, continue to submit those. Uh, we have the room until 730. Uh, hopefully, we can get through some of these questions before then. And, and again, I, I know some folks may not be able to stick around much longer. Um, and if that's the case, we are going to record the question and answer as well. Um, so okay. the first question that we received, uh, can you use fertilizer on native plants? And if so, what fertilizers are best, especially for those plants you may want to eat? Oh, wow. Um, well, I will first of all admit that I'm a terrible gardener. I mostly collect plants in the wild. Um, yes, you can fertilize uh, anything, but native plants are designed to grow well in, a, in our native systems here, and so they don't need as much fertilizer as, uh, as cultivated uh, species would need. So, you know, I would recommend if you want to fertilize native plants, you know, say, you, you know, you just really want to have some good production, that you use a really low level fertilizer on them, maybe even just compost, stir it into the soil. So something along those lines. And talk to someone at your garden center. <laughs> and if you're going to eat it, get organic fertilizer, you know, the general <laughs> things. Okay, the, the next question is hemlock, also known as water dropwort. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that could be another common name. I, I'm sure the Google will tell you. Ah, the Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so regarding elderberries, if you are baking or cooking with them, is there any issue with consuming the seeds? No. No. Awesome. No. You can, I mean, you. yeah, you just don't have to worry about the seeds. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, can you recommend a nursery to source elder? 
And can you grow them easily from the seeds if you decide to go that route instead? They're actually easier to grow from cuttings. So if you find a good one, um, you know, make some cuttings, stick them in, uh, stick them in a soil. You know, the, I don't think you even have to treat them with rooting medium or anything. And they, they will root readily. So cuttings is the way to go. Um, I do think there are some nurseries around town that have them. Um, I, I would have recommended Edible Plant Project in the past, but I'm not sure if they're still functioning. But yeah, check around. Okay, um, what would provide a good eye wash or compress for pink eye, irritated eye, or a sty? Oh, good question. <laughs> so um, just the disclaimer, you know, I can't make medical recommendations here, but um, the, the thing I have found to be very useful for pink eye is um, chamomile tea bags. Very easy uh, to, uh, you know, warm up some water, just pour a little bit of water in the teacup over the chamomile tea bag, um, you know, let it soak that up, um, and then apply those to the eyes. You could do two at a time. Just lay back and let them sit for 15 or 20 minutes, relax. Um, if you can do that a couple times a day, even three or four times a day, that will usually resolve um, most cases of pink eye. And the only caution is just, you know, don't put it on your eye when it's too hot. So, especially if you're working with a child, be careful there about the heat. Uh, could you give me some, t give some tips about collecting plants in the wild? Like, where is it okay and where is it not okay? Making sure not to take rare plants, etc. Right. Okay. This is a great question. Um, well, first of all, it's important to know the ownership of the land. Um, state parks and national parks, you are not supposed to do any collecting whatsoever. Um, you are allowed to collect in national forests, and I believe you're allowed to collect in national wildlife refuges, so those are some places. Um, city parks, you are not supposed to be collecting in, um, or county parks. Uh, so it, you know, it becomes a little bit of a balancing act to find a place where you can collect. You want to find a place that's clean, of course. You don't want to collect by roadsides. Um, we don't use leaded gas anymore, but our cars do give off a lot of other heavy metals from the brakes and from other parts. So, uh, so there's still a lot of pollutants on roadsides, and plants do tend to take those things up. Um, one of the better ways to collect is to find a farmer, maybe at the farmer's market, who would let you come and get weeds out of their garden. And that might be another way. Um, pardon me. Um, sustainability is a whole nother issue. Um, usually, we herbalists say that when you find the first patch of the plant, you don't harvest anything from that first patch. You go until you can find a second patch. And then you look at the population there and see, you know, what it can sustain. Now, with a lot of the plants I was talking about today, they're weeds, so it doesn't matter that much how much you harvest. So um, I did not talk about any rare or endangered plants today. Um, so I think you're okay. And, uh, you know, also you can get some of these going in your yard really easily, like passion flower, elderberry, uh, the dotted horse mint. Those will all do pretty well in your yard. And it, it looks like we've got one more question. Okay. Uh, black nightshade came up in my yard. Do you know if huh. this is safe to have around or is it poisonous? Yeah. Um, so, uh, by black nightshade, I'm assuming that you mean one of the um, of the group that we call American nightshades. These have black fruits when they're fully ripe, kind of a purple black color. Um, so that plant, you know, it is in the nightshade family. Uh, of course, we eat a lot of nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes uh, among them. Uh, so that plant, the fruits, when they're completely ripe, are edible, when they're that purple-black color. But that plant also could be challenging for livestock, if you have animals around that tend to eat things. Um, 
eat everything in sight, uh, that, you know, that might be a problem. I've never noticed that dogs are attracted to it. So, it, you know, it shouldn't be a problem for dogs. You would want to watch, you know, if you have kids, not to have them eating the, uh, the greens of that plant. Um, but the black, you know, the fruits are green at first and then they turn black and those are edible and they're really quite nice. Uh, and for a little more about that, I would recommend going to Green Dean's site, eattheweeds.com and uh, checking out uh, what he says about the American nightshade uh, clan of, of uh, fruits. Uh, and, and by the way, those plants have white flowers. If the plant has a purple flower, it is in the more toxic category for that for that particular genus. So uh, you know, so you're going to look for the white flowers and then the dark purple black berries at the end. They're like sweet little tomato berries. <laughs> okay. And while we were answering questions, Tom was kind enough to to Google hemlock and it is it is also according to google known as water drop word okay so, great so the google the google has answered <laughs> the google has spoken um so that's it i don't see any additional questions i just want to say thank you so much to susan for joining us tonight and, and educating us on some of the edible and medicinal uses of, of plants uh, that we find commonly in this area um, and if anyone has additional questions for Susan, her contact info is on the screen. Uh, you can also get an email to us through our website if you have questions. And uh, also keep a lookout on our website for additional events that we'll be doing. Uh, we don't know when we'll resume in-person events, but we do hope to host a, a virtual event at least once a month uh, for, for now. Um, and again, thank you so much, Susan. We really appreciate it. I certainly learned a lot and it Thank sounds like you. Thanks for having me. Enjoy everybody.